Chapter Twenty Three of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Park. I came down a little before eight next morning, as I knew by the striking of a distant clock. There was no appearance of breakfast. I waited above an hour before it came, still vainly longing for access to the library, and after that lonely repast was concluded, I waited again about an hour and a half in great suspense and discomfort, uncertain what to do. At length Lady Ashby came to bid me good morning. She informed me she had only just breakfasted, and now wanted me to take an early walk with her in the park. She asked how long I had been up, and on receiving my answer, expressed the deepest regret and again promised to show me the library. I suggested she had better do so at once, and then there would be no further trouble either with remembering or forgetting. She complied on condition that I would not think of reading or bothering with the books now, for she wanted to show me the gardens and take a walk in the park with me before it became too hot for enjoyment, which indeed was nearly the case already. Of course I readily assented, and we took our walk accordingly. As we were strolling in the park, talking of whatever my companion had seen and heard during her travelling experience, a gentleman on horseback rode up and passed us. As he turned in passing and stared me full in the face, I had a good opportunity of seeing what he was like. He was tall, thin, and wasted, with a slight stoop in the shoulders, a pale face, but somewhat blotchy and disagreeably red about the eyelids plain features, and a general appearance of languor and flatness, relieved by a sinister expression in the mouth and the dull, soulless eyes. "'I detest that man,' whispered Lady Ashley with bitter emphasis as he slowly trotted by. "'Who is it?' I asked, unwilling to suppose that she should speak so of her husband. "'Sir Thomas Ashby,' she replied with dreary composure. "'And do you detest him, Miss Murray?' said I for I was too much shocked to remember her name at the moment. "'Yes, I do, Miss Gray, and despise him, too, and if you knew him you would not blame me. But you knew what he was before you married him.' "'No, I only thought so. I did not half know him, really. I know you warned me against it, and I wish I had listened to you. But it's too late to regret that now. And besides, Mamma ought to have known better than either of us, and she never said anything against it. Quite the contrary.' And then I thought he adored me, and would let me have my own way. He did pretend to do so at first, but now he does not care a bit about me. Yet I should not care for that. He might do as he pleased, if only I might be free to amuse myself and to stay in London, or have a few friends down here. But he will do as he pleases, and I must be a prisoner and a slave. The moment he saw I could enjoy myself without him, and that others knew my value better than himself, the selfish wretch began to accuse me of coquetry and extravagance, and to abuse Harry Meltham, whose shoes he was not worthy to clean. And then he must needs have me down in the country, to lead a life of a nun, lest I should dishonour him or bring him to ruin, as if he had not been ten times worse every way, with his betting-book and his gambling-table and his opera-girls and his lady this and Mrs. that, yes and his bottles of wine and glasses of brandy and water too oh i would give ten thousand worlds to be miss murray again it is too bad to feel life health and beauty wasting away unfelt and unenjoyed for such a brute as that exclaimed she fairly bursting into tears at the bitterness of her vexation of course i pitied her exceedingly as well as for her false idea of happiness and disregard of duty as for the wretched partner with whom her fate was linked i said what i could to comfort her and offered such counsels as i thought she most required advising her first by gentle reasoning by kindness example and persuasion to try to ameliorate her husband and then when she had done all she could if she still found him incorrigible to endeavour to abstract herself from him to wrap herself up in her own integrity, and trouble herself as little about him as possible. I exhorted her to seek consolation in doing her duty to God and man, to put her trust in heaven, and solace herself with the care and nurture of her little daughter, assuring her she would be amply rewarded by witnessing its progress and strength and wisdom, and receiving its genuine affection. "'But I can't devote myself entirely to a child,' said she. "'It may die.' which is not at all improbable. 
but with care many a delicate infant has become a strong man or woman but it may grow so intolerably like its father that i should hate it that is not likely it is a little girl and strongly resembles its mother no matter i should like it better if it were a boy only that its father would leave it no inheritance that he can possibly squander away what pleasure can i have in seeing a girl grow up to eclipse me and enjoy those pleasures that i am forever debarred from but supposing i could be so generous as to take delight in this still it is only a child and i can't centre all my hopes in a child that is only one degree better than devoting oneself to a dog and as for all the wisdom and goodness you have been trying to instil into me that is all very right and proper i dare say and if i were some twenty years older i might fructify by it but people must enjoy themselves when they are young and if others won't let them why they must hate them for it the best way to enjoy yourself is to do what is right and hate nobody the end of religion is not to teach us how to die but how to live the earlier you become wise and good the more of happiness you secure and now lady ashby i have one more piece of advice to offer you which is that you will not make an enemy of your mother-in-law don't get in the way of holding her at arm's length and regarding her with jealous distrust i never saw her but i have heard good as well as evil respecting her and i imagine that though cold and haughty in her general demeanour and even exacting in her requirements she has strong affections for those who can reach them and though so blindly attached to her son she is not without good principles or incapable of hearing reason if you will but conciliate her a little and adopt a friendly open manner and even confide your grievances to her real grievances such as you have a right to complain of it is my firm belief that she would in time become your faithful friend and a comfort and support to you instead of the incubus you describe her but i fear my advice had little effect upon the unfortunate young lady and finding i could render myself so little serviceable my residence at ashby park became doubly painful but still i must stay out that day and the following one as i had promised to do so though resisting all entreaties and inducements to prolong my visit further i insisted upon departing the next morning affirming that my mother would be lonely without me and that she impatiently expected my return nevertheless it was with a heavy heart that i bade adieu to poor lady ashby and left her in her princely home it was no slight additional proof of her unhappiness that she should so cling to the consolation of my presence and earnestly desire the company of one whose general tastes and ideas were so little congenial to her own whom she had completely forgotten in the hour of her prosperity and whose presence would be rather a nuisance than a pleasure if she could but have half her heart's desire End of chapter 23